Compliance Training 2015 Learning the main points of the Japanese anti-monopoly law Produced by Inlexvritas.com As we've discussed, my company will take the contract for this project. Remember, if you don't honor our agreement, you'll never be awarded a contract again. Hey, what do you think you're doing? We're in a meeting. We're here from the Japan Fair Trade Commission. And we're here to conduct a search on suspicion of violation of Article 3 of the Anti-Monopoly Act. While this was a skit from the official website of the Japan Fair Trade Commission, which administers the Anti-Monopoly Law or Act. Probably, it would not happen in this way in the real world, but the skit was a certainly good dramatization of the supposed role of the Commission, albeit in a daytime soap opera way. Anyway, I hope the skit has at least piqued your interest in wanting to learn more about this Anti-Monopoly Law, as applied to your professional life. In any event, thank you for participating in the Compliance Training 2015. My name is Lexi Vritas. For today's training, I will be going over the main points of the Japanese anti-monopoly law. This so-called anti-monopoly law embodies a complicated set of rules and regulations, but for our purposes here, the law would be broken down into two parts for very high-level explanations. Now, then, what is the Anti-Monopoly Law? The formal name of the law is the Act on Prohibition of Private Monopolization and Maintenance of Fair Trade in English, that in short, is referred to as the Anti-Monopoly Law. The acts of enterprises, that is, companies, prohibited under the law are those acts, which substantially restrain free competition, or which tend to impede fair competition. Moreover, the law is applicable to all enterprises or companies engaged in business activities, irrespective of their business scales or types. In short, the anti-monopoly law is applicable to all enterprises, that is, companies, for the purposes of promoting fair and free competition. In order to implement the anti-monopoly law, an administrative agency was established, the Japan Fair Trade Commission. Here, let's view a PR clip from its official website, introducing the Commission's organizational structure. The JFTC consists of a chairman and four commissioners, who are appointed by the Prime Minister with the approval of the Diet. It performs its duties independently of other administrative organs. Beneath the Commission is the General Secretariat, which heads multiple sections that present policy proposals and investigate cases. With approximately 800 employees, the JFTC strives to strengthen both its organization and human resources to more effectively fulfill its increasingly important role. It was a short clip, but did you get the general idea as to the role of the Japan Fair Trade Commission in implementing the anti-monopoly law? Now, let's delve into the anti-monopoly law a little bit. Under the anti-monopoly law, there are three main types of prohibitions for the purposes of promoting fair and free competition. There are as follows. 1. Prohibition of private monopolization. 2. Prohibition of unreasonable, restraint of trade. And 3. Prohibition of unfair trade practices. Undoubtedly, as for the regulatory environment, with respect to the anti-monopoly law, is becoming much stricter. In other words, by way of recent revisions in the law, the risks of detection of the acts prohibited are becoming higher and the penalties steeper. In response, the enterprises or companies have sought to strengthen their in-house compliance system. Next, 
Let us review the prohibited acts under the anti-monopoly law. This topic came up in the previous slide, but do you remember that private monopolization was one of the types of prohibited acts under the anti-monopoly law? Private monopolization means a substantial restraint of competition in a field of trade by exclusion or control of the business activities of other enterprises or companies by a dominant enterprise, individually or with others. I am not sure whether there was actual private monopolization. But I think the case you probably are familiar with is the M Corporation in the field of software. There is a skit provided in the website of the JFTC, that is, Japan Fair Trade Commission, which sort of gives dramatized examples of private monopolization. Let's watch. Shall we? My company has just developed a new product. We'd like to price it at 100 yen. We'll enter the market and compete with other companies. With more competitors, my profits will drop. Hmm. I know. Even though I'll lose money, I'll slash prices to 10 yen, which is much lower than cost, and force my competitors out of business. Once they're gone, I'll really raise my prices. <laughs> More competition would be bad for me as well. I know. I'll acquire my rival's stock. I'll infiltrate the board of directors and control management to stop competition. And, moving further on to the comical side, let's pull out this skit from The Simpsons. Oh, they have the internet on computers now. Homer, Bill Gates is here. Bill Gates? Billionaire computer nerd, Bill Gates? Oh my god, oh my god. Get out of sight, Marge. I don't want this to look like a two-bit operation. Mm. Mr. Simpson? You don't look so rich. Don't let the haircut fool you. I'm exceedingly wealthy. Get a load of the ball job, Marge. Your internet ad was brought to my attention, but I can't figure out what, if anything, Compu Global Hyper Mega Net does. So rather than risk competing with you, I've decided simply to buy you out. This is it, Marge. I poured my heart and soul into this business, and now it's finally paying off. We're rich, richer than astronauts. Oh, we're quiet. You'll queer the deal. Oh, right. I reluctantly accept your proposal. Well, everyone always does. Buy them out, boys! Hey, what the hell's going on? Oh, I didn't get rich by writing a lot of checks. <laughs> Here, it's somewhat comical, yes, but the reality in Japan is not funny at all. Next, let's delve into unreasonable restraint of trade. Unreasonable restraint of trade means a substantial restraint of competition in a field of trade by a mutual restriction of business activities by an enterprise in concert with others. Typical examples are cartels and bid rickings. There is a skit for this topic as well. Let's watch. All right. Shall we raise the price of our products to, say, 50,000 yen? Yes. And if we all sell at the same price, we won't have to compete with each other. We'll all make much more money this way. <laughs> so it's settled. My company will receive the next contract. So make sure you bid higher than we do. Understood. But remember... This means that next time it will be my company's turn to receive the contract. Bid breaking in certain industries in Japan has been one of the persistent anti-monopoly violations, which has recently become technically sophisticated to evade detection by the authorities. As for unreasonable restraint of trade, as in cartels or bid breakings, prohibited are the acts, the so-called concerted acts, 
which mutually restrict business activities. As for a concerted act, it ordinarily requires a communication of intent as between the enterprises, but it is understood that a tacit or implicit agreement would be sufficient for this purpose. Now, allow me to explain the concept of unfair trade practices. In general, it could be said that there are eight main types of unfair trade practices. Remind you, there certainly are others. First, as for refusal to deal, this includes, without justifiable grounds, an act of refusing to deal or transact with a certain enterprise, or an act of restricting the quantity or substance of goods or services supplied to a certain enterprise. Let's view the skit, which portrays a typical case. I want to start a new business. But what I need are raw materials to make my products. I can't have any more competition. I know. I'll put pressure on the raw material manufacturer that I deal with to stop selling to new companies. And if he does sell to any of them, I won't do business with him anymore. As for discriminatory pricing or discriminatory treatment, this includes unjustly and continually supplying goods or services at a price or terms applied differentially between regions or between parties. As for unjust low price sales, or price dumping, this means, without justifiable grounds, an act of continuously supplying goods or services at a price far below the cost incurred to supply them thereby tending to cause difficulties to the business activities of other enterprises. As for tie-in sales, or bundling, this includes an act of causing a counterparty in continuous transactions to purchase goods or services, other than those to which said transactions pertain. As for dealing on exclusive terms, this involves, without justifiable grounds, causing the counterparty to deal or transact exclusively with a dominant enterprise with respect to its own products or services, prohibiting other third-party dealings or transactions. As for resale price restriction, this involves causing a retailer, for example, to maintain the reselling price of the goods that a manufacturer of such goods has beforehand determined, or otherwise restricting said retailer's free decision on reselling price of the goods. Here, it just happens that there is a skit provided by the JFTC. Let's watch. I'm a retailer. Please sell some products to me wholesale. I won't sell my products to any retailers who sell below the price I set. Well, that was short and sweet, and down to the point. As for dealing on restrictive terms, this includes dealing with the counterparty on such conditions as will unjustly restrict the business activities of said counterparty. As for abuse of dominant bargaining position, this could be viewed as a sort of catch-all provision. It involves making use of an enterprise's superior bargaining position over the counterparty, unjustly, in light of normal business practices to execute a transaction in a way disadvantageous to said counterparty. It would be something like this, egregious as it may be. You supplied me with products, but they didn't all sell well. Take them back. Now, if there is a violation of the anti-monopoly law, what would happen? If a violation of the anti-monopoly law is found, the Japan Fair Trade Commission may issue a cease and desist order, in conjunction with, depending on the acts in violation, a surcharge. Moreover, if a violation of the anti-monopoly law is found, not only the enterprise, that is, the company, may be criminally punishable, so may the individuals or the employees therein. Even in the cases such as follows, there may be criminal penalties for the individuals or the employees, such as a. An employee is merely following the direction of his or her manager. b. 
an enterprise or a company had assured the employee that it would take full responsibility. C. An employee had personally thought, albeit wrongfully, that there were no violation of the anti-monopoly law. Or, D. An employee had just been reassigned to the certain section of the enterprise or the company, and such employee was not aware of the circumstances in detail. In regard to the JFTC getting involved, some cases are initiated by whistleblowers, as in the following skit. One day, an anonymous caller informs the JFTC that a certain company is involved in bid rigging, a violation of the Anti-Monopoly Act. Japan Fair Trade Commission. I work at Acme Corporation. My company and one of our rivals are involved in bid rigging. I see. Could you please tell me more about this in detail? The JFTC gathers information that helps uncover cases of illegal activity through reports such as this one. The JFTC is authorized to conduct two different types of investigations. Administrative investigations, which involve on-site inspections of companies suspected of illegal acts, and criminal investigations for cases deemed to be criminal in nature. To tell you the truth, I think, this kit, more than other spins produced by the JFTC, seems to stray too far from the reality of the day in Japan. First of all, the supposed whistleblower appears too young to know what bid rigging is, or to have any meaningful access to such illegal activities in a typical corporation in Japan. Remember, as in other areas of the law, a whistleblower is taking a tremendous amount of personal risks, and perhaps, only the few brave souls would choose to take this path. This is especially true in a society, such as in Japan, where the labor market is rather rigid with relative lack of employment mobility. In addition to implementing the law and ensuing investigations, the Japan Fair Trade Commission is involved in other activities as well, such as public relations and consultations, as explained in the following video. The JFTC advises companies and organizations with regards to the Anti-Monopoly Act. By carefully considering consultations from a variety of sectors and industries, it provides guidance to prevent illegal activities. Because mergers and other business combinations between large companies could hinder competition, they must submit notifications and reports of such activities to the JFTC for review. In certain cases, the JFTC requests that the company change its plans. I am somewhat amazed by how young the JFTC officials are, that is, those who are assigned to the post who are in direct contact with the general public, as in the video. Also, there is a sense of some uneasiness due to the fact that there is a dearth of privacy. As shown in the video, you could see a group of people, talking to the JFTC official, right next to the open booth with another group of people, within the eavesdrop distance. I would think that what they are talking about are very sensitive and confidential issues, very strange, indeed. Wrapping up for now, although this presentation was somewhat a high-level and summarized explanation of what is considered to be one of the most complicated areas of the law. For our purposes for general in-house training, I think this is a good place to call it a day. Thank you very much for your time and attention.